Welcome to the React Clarified Thinking in React video course. This is the introduction to the course, in which we will explain who this course is for, what it is about, and how to set your environment up so that you can follow along in code. Who is this course for? This is not a course for complete beginners to React. If you don't know how to set up a React app, or if you are unclear about what props or state are, then you will need a beginner course, or you could familiarize yourself with the official React documentation, which is an excellent resource. You will get the most out of this course if you are familiar with some basic HTML, CSS, and JavaScript ES6. Also, you should know some basic React and how to set up a React app using the Create React App package. In addition, since we will only be using functional components and not class components in this course, you should know about the React hook for dealing with state, namely the useState hook. To clarify if this course is for you, here are some questions. Do you know when to use props versus when to use state for your data? Do you know which components should own state? Do you know how data flows through your app? Do you know how to update your data when a user interacts with your app? If you answered no to any of these questions, then this short course is for you. If you answered yes of course to all the questions, then you probably are too advanced a React practitioner to find this course useful. About this course. In this video course, we will learn by building a simple user interface in just over 30 minutes. It focuses on how to think conceptually about building user interfaces using React. It is based on the Thinking in React article on the official React documentation site at reactjs.org. We will now get started with setting up a simple React app. Please use your command line interface to do so. Please check that you have a recent version of Node installed so that you can use the npx command. We will be using the create react app package to set up a React app. We will call the app thinking in React. Running this command may take a minute or so. Change directory into the thinking in React folder created by the previous command. To run the app, type yarn start or npm start if that is your preferred task runner. The app will open in your default browser at localhost 3000. Also, open the current folder in your preferred code editor. We will be using Atom. We have completed the setup, and we have our code editor Atom on the left of our screen. And we have a Chrome browser window on the right of our screen. We have opened the index.js file in the source folder of our project. Here you can see that the app is rendered to the DOM. For our course, we will start from scratch, so delete all the code from this file. We will work only within this index.js file for our course. We will hide the project tree view on the left. Let's get started. In our first video, we will start with a mock-up of the user interface and some sample data from a mock JSON API, and we will show you how to break up the user interface of the app into a component hierarchy. We will build a searchable product table which shows sporting goods and electronics along with their price and their availability in stock. Imagine that we already have a mock-up of this product table from our designer. The mock-up of the searchable product table looks like this. It has a search bar at the top with a checkbox below it to toggle showing only products in stock. 
and the table of products below that with their category and price. Out of stock product names appear in a red color. Imagine that we already have a JSON API that returns some data that looks like this. The data is an array of product items, which are objects containing category, price, and name fields, and also a Boolean flag showing if a certain product is stocked. The first thing you'll want to do is to draw boxes around every component and subcomponent in the mockup and give them all names. If you're working with a designer, they may have already done this. You may find that you can use the same names for your components as the designer has used to name the layers within their graphics program to create the mockup. But how do you know what should be its own component? Just use the same techniques for deciding if you should create a new function or object. One such technique is the single responsibility principle, that is, a component should ideally only do one thing. If it ends up growing, it should be decomposed into smaller subcomponents. Since you're often displaying a JSON data model to a user, you'll find that if your model was built correctly, your UI, and therefore your component structure, will map nicely. That's because UI and data models tend to adhere to the same information architecture, which means the work of separating your UI into components is often trivial. Just break your UI up into components that represent exactly one piece of your data model. We have five components in our simple app. One, the filterable product table contains the entirety of the example. Two, the search bar receives all user input. Three, the product table displays and filters the data collection based on user input. Four, the product category row displays a heading for each category. Five, the product row displays a row for each product. If you look at product table, you'll see that the table header containing the name and price labels isn't its own component. This is a matter of preference, and there's an argument to be made either way. For this example, we left it as part of product table because it is part of rendering the data collection, which is product table's responsibility. However, if this header grows to be complex, for instance, if we were to add affordances for sorting, it would certainly make sense to make this its own product table header component. Now that we've identified the components in our mockup, let's arrange them into a hierarchy. Components that appear within another component in the mockup should appear as a child in the hierarchy. In our second video, we will start building a static version of the filterable product table and search bar components based on the mockup. Now that you have your component hierarchy, it's time to implement your app. The easiest way to start is to build a version that takes your data model and renders the UI but has no interactivity. It's best to decouple these processes because building a static version requires a lot of typing and no thinking, and adding interactivity requires a lot of thinking and not a lot of typing. We will see why. To build a static version of your app that renders your data model, you'll want to build components that reuse other components and pass data using props. Props are a way of passing data from parent to child. Don't use state at all to build this static version. State is reserved only for interactivity, that is, data that changes over time. Since this is a static version of the app, you don't need it. You can build top-down or bottom-up. That is, you can either start with building the components higher up in the hierarchy or with the ones lower in it. In our case, you can either start with building filterable product table or with product row. 
in simpler examples, it's usually easier to go top down. And on larger projects, it's easier to go bottom up than write tests as you build. In our case, we will go top down, starting with the filterable product table. At the end of this step, you'll have a library of reusable components that render your data model. The components will only consist of the return expression since this is a static version of your app. The component at the top of the hierarchy, the filterable product table, will take your data model as a prop. If you make a change to your underlying data model and render your components to the DOM again, the UI will be updated. It's easy to see how your UI is updated and where to make changes since there's nothing complicated going on. React's one-way data flow, also called one-way binding, keeps everything modular and fast. Let's start building. We will assign the data to a constant called products. Now we will render our top level component, the filterable product table, to the DOM, passing in the products data to a prop that we will call lowercase products. At the top of our file, we will import React and React DOM. Now, let's define the filterable product table component. We will use function components and JavaScript ES6's arrow function notation. First, we will destructure products from props. We will get started with the return expression, wrapping everything in a div which gives its contents a sans serif font style. At the top of the filterable product table, we will place the search bar, which will take user input. Below the search bar, the product table element will be displayed. For the time being, we will add some placeholder text so that we can work on the product table component later. Next, we will define the search bar component. It will return a form which will contain the user input fields. The first input is an input type text with some placeholder text. For the next input, we will wrap it in a paragraph. we will add an input type checkbox. And a green label for the checkbox input after a space. Save the file to see the effect of the code changes in the browser. In our third video, we will build static versions of the product table, product row, and product category row components based on our mock up. In the previous video, we added a placeholder for the product table. We will now add the product table element to the filterable product table component.
we will pass the product's data to the product table as a prop, which it needs for display. Save the file to see the browser update. We will continue by defining the product table component. First, we will destructure products from props. Next, we will return a full width table. We will add table head and table body elements to the table. The table head will have a table row with blue coloured contents. We will add two table head cells to the table head. Save the file. In the table body, we want to show the filtered list of product names and prices. Each row of the filtered list will be a product row element. We will start by defining a variable called rows as an array of product row elements to display. Initially, the rows array will be empty. We will push each product row onto the rows array using the for each method. For each product in the products data array, push a product row onto the rows array. We will inject the product into the product row as a prop which it will need to show the name and price. In addition, we will need to specify a key to each product row in the rows array. We will use the product name as the key. Now we will add the rows array to the table body. Save the file to see your updates in the browser. Next, we will define the product row component. First, we will destructure the product from props. Then, we will return a table row. Within the table row, we will display a table data cell with the product name and the product price. Save your file. In our mockup, the products that are not in stock display their name in red. We will need to add this feature to the product row component. If the product is stocked, then display the product name as it is now. Otherwise, display it with a red color. Assign the result of this ternary expression to a variable, which we will call colored name. Finally, we'll update the returned table data cell showing the product name. Save your file. We still need to add the product category row to the filterable product table. We will push a product category row element to the rows array in the product table component.
we will inject the product into the product category row as a prop, which you will need to get the category. In addition, we will need to specify a key to each product category row in the rows array. We will use the product category as the key. Save your file. Now we will define the product category row component. Next, destructure product from props. Now, return a table row with a table head cell that spans two columns. Within the table head cell, display the product category. Save your file. There is a bug in our product table. The product category row shows before each product row, but it should only appear once before a group of products within the same category. The products dataset has products grouped by category, so we can check which category of product was last displayed and only show the product category row when the category changes. We will define a variable called last category and initially set it to null. Now we will check if the current product's category differs from the last category and only push the product category row onto the row's array if that is the case. Finally, we will update the last category to be the current products category after pushing the product row to the rows array. Save the file and view the completed static version of the app. It is very similar to our mockup, so we have successfully implemented the static version. In our fourth video, we will talk about how we should identify the minimal, but complete, representation of UI state, and also determine which component should own the state. To make your UI interactive, you need to be able to trigger changes to your underlying data model. React makes this easy with state. To build your app correctly, you first need to think of the minimal set of mutable state that your app needs. The key here is to be dry, that is, don't repeat yourself. Figure out the absolute minimal representation of state that your application needs and compute everything else you need on demand. For example, if you're building a to-do list, just keep an array of the to-do items around. Don't keep a separate state variable for the count. Instead, when you want to render the count, simply take the length of the to-do items array. Think of all the pieces of data in our example application. We have the original list of products, the search text the user has entered, the value of the checkbox, and the filtered list of products. Let's go through each one and figure out which one is state. Simply ask three questions about each piece of data. 1. Is it passed in from a parent via props? If so, it probably isn't state. 2. Does it remain unchanged over time? 
If so, it probably isn't state. 3. Can you compute it based on any other state or props in your component? If so, it isn't state. Now, let's run through these questions for each piece of data within our application. The original list of products is passed in as props, so that's not state. The search text seems to be state since it changes over time and can't be computed from anything. The checkbox seems to be state as well, since it also changes over time and can't be computed from anything either. And finally, the filtered list of products isn't state because it can be computed by combining the original list of products with the search text and the value of the checkbox. So finally, our state is the search text that the user has entered and the value of the checkbox. We've now identified what the minimal set of app state is. Next, we need to identify which component mutates, or owns, this state. Remember, React is all about one-way data flow down the component hierarchy. It may not be immediately clear which component should own what state. This is often the most challenging part for newcomers to understand, so follow the following steps to figure it out. For each piece of state in your application, identify every component that renders something based on that state. And find a common owner component, that is, a single component above all the components that need the state in the hierarchy. Either the common owner or another component higher up in the hierarchy should own the state. If you can't find a component where it makes sense to own the state, create a new component simply for holding the state and add it somewhere in the hierarchy above the common owner component. Let's run through this strategy for our application. Product table needs to filter the product list based on state and search bar needs to display the search text and checked state. The common owner component is filterable product table. It conceptually makes sense for the filter text and checked value to live in filterable product table. In our fifth video, we will implement state in our application. Now, We've decided that our state lives in filterable product table. We've determined that the search text the user enters is state. We will use the useState hook to hold state. We will call this state variable filter text and give it an initial value of an empty string. We determined that the value of the checkbox, which when checked only shows products in stock, is the other piece of state in our application. We will call the state variable in stock only and give it an initial value of false. Save the file. We will need to import useState from the React library. Save the file. We will now inject our filter text and in stock only state to both the search bar and product table components. Save the file. Now let's make use of filter text and in stock only within our search bar component via props.
we will make our text input field a controlled component using the filter text value. And we will make our checkbox input a controlled component using the in stock only checked value. Save the file. We can now update the initial values of our state variables in the filterable product table component to see if we can correctly control the search bar. We will change the initial value of filter text to be the text literal ball, for example. And we will change the initial value of in stock only to be the Boolean value true. Save the changes and check if the input fields in the browser reflect them. We can now undo these changes. We will now make use of our state variables in the product table component via props. We can make use of these prop values when pushing product category rows into the product table. If the product name does not include the filter text the user is searching for, then the product should not be pushed to the product table. We can implement this by checking the index of method on the product name by passing in the filter text, and if it equals minus one, then the filter text cannot be found and we can return without pushing. In addition, if the user has chosen only to see products in stock and the product is not stocked, then similarly return without pushing. Save the file. We can now update the initial values of our state variables in the filterable product table component to see if we can correctly control the product table. As we did before, change the initial value of filter text to be the text literal ball. Save the file to see the browser update. You can see in the browser that the product table only shows products containing the text ball within their name. Let's undo this change. And again, we will change the initial value of in stock only to be the Boolean value true. Save the file to see the browser update. You can see in the browser that the product table only shows products that are in stock. Let's undo this change. In this sixth and final explanatory video, we will add inverse data flow by passing callbacks from the state source down the hierarchy to the components which respond to user input using event listeners. So far, we've built an app that renders correctly as a function of props and state flowing down the hierarchy. Now it's time to support data flowing the other way. The form components deep in the hierarchy need to update the state in the top level filterable product table component. React makes this data flow explicit to make it easy to understand how your program works, but it does require a little more typing than traditional two-way data binding. If you try to type in the search bar or check the box in the current version of the example, you'll see that React ignores your input. Nothing happens. Now click on the checkbox. We have confirmed that neither typing in the search input nor checking the input box have any effect. This is intentional 
as we've set the value prop of the search input and the checked prop of the checkbox to always be equal to the state passed in from filterable product table. Let's think about what we want to happen. We want to make sure that whenever the user changes the form, we update the state to reflect the user input. Since components should only update their own state, filterable product table will pass callbacks to search bar, which will fire whenever the state should be updated. Let's show that now. In the filterable product table, we will create the callback functions. We will call the first callback handle filter text change, and it will take the filter text state value as its input parameter. It will call the filter text state setter with the input value. The second callback will be called handle in stock only change, and it will take the in stock only state value as its input parameter. It will call the in stock only state setter with the input value. We will now pass these callbacks to the search bar. The first callback will be passed as a prop called onFilterTextChange. The second callback will be passed as a prop called onInStockOnlyChange. Save the file. We will now make use of these props within the search bar component. We will first make some space for our new props. Now destructure on filter text change and on in stock only change from props. Next, we will make space in our input elements for event listeners. The input type text has an on change event listener which fires on every user keystroke within the input field. We can use the event.target.value to update the handle filter text change callback, which is available here via the on filter text change prop. The input type checkbox has an on change event listener which fires whenever the user checks the box. We can use the event.target.checked to update the handle in stock only change callback, which is available here via the on in stock only change prop. Save the file. We can now check our app in the browser. First, type ball into the search field. We can see that we get a filtered list showing only the products containing the text ball. Next, we will click on the checkbox. We can see that we only get shown products that are in stock. The one way binding used in React makes it really explicit how your data is flowing throughout the app. 
we've reached the end of the video. We hope you have enjoyed React Clarified, Thinking in React.